Good morning. There is some delay in one of the hotels, but it apparently it will take still a little bit of time. So I would invite Mr. Harold Susan to do his keynote speech this morning. Professor Susan, who I think by now everyone knows, uh, is a professor at the New York uh, State University, um, a philosopher, and I think he devoted a large part of his research to issues with, uh, relating uh, humanities, ethics, and beyond with the technology and thinking about how technology and humanities interact and what can humanities say about this topic. Apart from this, Professor Sujan is a member of the Asian New Humanities and uh, in that uh, context, he has been collaborating in the establishment of new UNESCO chairs, particularly a, a sort of migrating chair that started to be planned for Hong Kong, then moved to Shaman, and finally landed in McGill University in Canada. So it's really a, a, a global chair. So thank you very much for being here, Harold. Um, please take it. Thank you for coming out, and uh, I'm going to try to uh, present a uh, argument, or at least the outline of an argument. And what I do will be incomplete. Uh, I hope it points to some ideas that we can uh, reflect on. I'm going to cite quite a few uh, people who I think have contributions to make and in a sense commend you to look at those and so that's a strategy. Um, my title, Technological Ethics, just want to explain a couple of terms. Uh, technological ethics, of course, has something to do uh, specifically with the ethical dilemmas that are generated by technology and uh, the kinds of examples that come most readily and immediately to mind for most people would be saying, uh, our modern, sorry, okay, am I broadcasting now? Yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> See, I'm not very good with technology. <laughs> uh, so technological ethics, of course, has something to do with the kinds of... Specifically, uh, produced by technology. For example, in medicine, we have all sorts of end-of-life decisions uh, that uh, caregivers uh, are called upon to make, uh, which a generation or two ago were almost unthinkable. Uh, and it, uh, you know, who, and who, who should uh, benefit from this technology and why and what does this say about the meaning of life? Those are specifically uh, technology-generated ethical issues. But I'm using the term I think a little bit more broadly uh, to suggest that ethics in general is permeated now, or our ethical thinking is in general permeated now uh, by uh, the presence and uh, influence of technology. Uh, faith, I'm bringing this in because uh, very often uh, people think of ethics as being derived from, for example, a religious uh, belief system or something like that, and uh, they uh, often uh, uh, follow ethical guidelines which are, in essence, uh, uh, admonitions of a religious teaching. And uh, sometimes when you go to a kind of uh, extreme of that, it creates problems. And so that's what I'm going to mention. The crisis of Earth, I mean largely climate change, uh, but uh, I mean... Uh, uh, many other things in terms of environmental degradation, uh, the uh, quality of uh, food, uh, the uh, state of uh, 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 water management, and many, many things. Um, so the discourse of humanities fails to address the problems of technology. Uh, what I don't mean is that humanists are supposed to be able to explain how to fix my Samsung phone which stopped working. I mean, that's a technological problem for which technological speech or de technological discourse is what's needed. Uh, but I'm talking about uh, the uh, 
a larger understanding of things. So having said that, uh, there are too many words up here. I'm just going to highlight uh, things as we go along. Uh, but I'm pointing out that technology is ubiquitous. That is to say, there's nothing or virtually nothing that we ever do uh, that's not in some sense shaped or informed by technology. And if we would like, so to speak, to get off the grid and live without technology, this is more than a radical decision. It's an essentially impossible decision if we're going to survive and if we're going to be part of the human community. So I argue that technology defines challenges, supports all of our endeavors, and while in some sense solves them, creates many of our problems. To a great extent, technology forms the categories for how we think about most things, uh, including the perennially enduring big questions of philosophy. So kind of paraphrasing Marx uh, here, I say that it's not God who has created us, but technology who has made us. Um, so. I'm going to refer to uh, several people that I think uh, make important contributions, not because they have specifically thematized the problem of technology, but because their way of thinking about uh, human community, the human condition, uh, and the uh, challenges of life uh, in our time uh, seem to me to make important contributions from which, if we think about this in the context of technology is helpful. So uh, Amitav Ghosh uh, is a, I think, wonderful novelist for the most part, uh, comes from West Bengal. Uh, but he uh, recently, uh, or a couple of years ago, delivered some uh, lectures uh, at the University of Chicago, which are now summarized in this little book, The Great Derangement. Uh, which I think speaks specifically to what we're talking about. Hans Jonas, uh, who was uh, one of my teachers and who influenced me a lot uh, toward the uh, uh, end of his career, uh, took up the question of ethics and wrote a book which was enormously influential in Europe uh, called The Imperative Re Responsibility. And uh, this book argues that the central question uh, of ethics today is the question of responsibility. And the question of responsibility is uh, problematized by the fact uh, that the range of our action, the effectiveness of our action and so on, in many cases is mediated by technology and in some sense beyond our control. Um, Søren Kierkegaard. 19th century religious <coughs> philosopher, poet, polemicist, gadfly, modeled himself after Socrates, basically, uh, walked around uh, Copenhagen uh, annoying people uh, and challenging them to reflect on the implications of what they're doing. Uh, it seems to me that as well as anybody, uh, Kierkegaard captures the sense of crisis what it means to live in an age of crisis. Uh, and uh, he also uh, proposes a kind of radical solution uh, through an understanding of the concept of faith. And it's this concept of faith, which I believe uh, has uh, been somewhat distorted and leads to problems of our own. And then finally, my, my other uh, teacher, uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, uh, who uh, uh, most everybody knows about, uh, and uh, I'm going to be looking uh, at uh, both her early work and her late work, but uh, the life of the mind uh, really is addressed to what I'm calling the discourse of humanities in some sense. Okay, my thesis, I'm proposing a mismatch between the discourse of humanities as we know it, or as we practice it, and 
Then now I'm drawing on another, uh, in this case, very controversial figure, Martin Heidegger, uh, what he called the uh, question concerning technology. What I mean is uh, that Heidegger's grasp of what he calls the question concerning technology, I will explain that in a few minutes, uh, is not effectively addressed uh, in the uh, discourse of the humanities, including philosophy. Now, I need to emphasize that all of this is about contemporary technology and not technology, certainly not the technology that we explored in our workshop the other day uh, when we chipped stones and, and made ropes and so on and so forth. Talking about contemporary uh, technology, uh, the salient feature uh, that, that leads to the problem in my mind is the uh, ability of technology to operate more or less autonomously. That is to say, technology cannot, I'm arguing, be properly conceived as tools that we use and that we are completely in control of, but rather, in many ways, they determine what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and uh, we are not uh, the controllers of it. Um, God created man in this tradition. God created humanity, as we should better put it. Uh, uh, meaning that we have something special, that we stand in a special relationship uh, to the ultimate reality and to all of creation. It seems to me that that understanding uh, leads to serious problems, and I'm going to raise questions about it. Uh, so this all has implications for how we understand what human nature is, or I'm going to, in an attempt to avoid essentializing language, uh, speak about the human condition. So the human condition is not fixed and permanent, but the human condition is something which is dynamic and ongoing, uh, embedded in history, uh, and the like. Consequently, it would follow from that, I think, uh, that uh, conditions of changing nature and the uh, changing powers of technology and other things are going to have uh, an, imp an implication for the nature of human nature. Uh, technology specifically uh, raises this question. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Donna Haraway's work, A Cyborg Manifesto, sort of uh, proposing the question, aren't we all cyborgs now? Uh, meaning that aren't we already, you know, part machines? We're so dependent on machines that our own actions, in a sense, are shared with uh, the uh, purposes and uh, functions and so on of the machine. Now, we can also recognize our relationship to animals. Uh, we can also recognize, uh, you know, the implications of networking and so on. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Hathaway, or Haraway, I mean, and uh, others all acknowledge this. So let's have a little thought experiment uh, to see if I can advance my thoughts uh, or my ideas here. And uh, I say, uh, let's imagine a complex system, an ecosystem that constitutes the environment where humans reside. And I will characterize this ecosystem under the components of ethics, faith, and the crisis of Earth. In other words, the three elements that I tried to single out in the title. And the problem, I'm arguing, is that humanity's discourse is a manifestation of an incommensurability of traditional understanding of what constitutes ethics, what constitutes the concept of faith, and the prevailing notions about humanity in our natural abode. Maybe I should say, humanity's discourse in its conservative nature is holding on to certain traditional characterizations of things, 
And these traditional characterizations of things uh, are now coming uh, to bump heads. So this calling incommensurability is due to an alteration in the premises of being human, and that, I'm arguing, is a consequence of contemporary technology. Now this is kind of a standard uh, ecosystem, I think. Uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, Jerry Martin's uh, uh, view is a summative view of things that many people uh, take in and uh, uh, take as being correct. Uh, and we see this kind of cycle uh, where, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, the status of society, economic uh, determinations of society, values derived from wherever, aesthetic, ethical, so on, social organization, they throw us in technology as just one of these. And this, you know, takes care of, addresses the natural ecosystem, which in some sense uh, is altered, modified, uh, strengthened, weakened, and this comes back uh, to uh, characterize our life. Now, I just want to uh, vary this a little bit and simplify it. Uh, so, what I'm saying is that uh, the human animal, the human being, uh, looks at things mediated by technology. In other words, we don't see anything in an absolute or pure way. Everything is highly perspectival. Uh, this perspective is determined uh, by the technology uh, that is influencing the experience at the time. Technology has a direct impact on nature. I don't think that's controversial at all. Uh, of course, uh, uh, tools and uh, so on and so forth uh, alter nature. Uh, the building of cities, the construction of infrastructure, the creation of what we call the built world, which turns out, of course, to be the same thing as the lived world. So, I mean, we don't live in nature, we live in the built world, or that is to say, we live in the nature, we live in the world that we made, and the world that we made was enabled by technology. Uh, this, of course, has many implications for society. Think of just urbanization as an example. Uh, that's the social response to the built world, among other things. Uh, this then expresses itself through technology. Airplanes, my broken Samsung phone, uh, you name it. Uh, and so, who we are now comes back uh, to be defined by uh, technology. So it's that cycle that I think uh, characterizes the uh, dynamic relationship. So here I'm referring to uh, uh, Heidegger, and uh, I'm going to refer specifically uh, to uh, a book which uh, uh, began as a lecture. Heidegger is just uh, not a good person to cite when you want to talk about the discourse of humanities because his use of language is extraordinarily idiosyncratic, and uh, many people scratch their heads about what he means. But anyway, um, I'm re referring to a lecture which uh, he gave in Bremen, uh, Das Gestell, translated as Enframing, later published uh, in uh, 1954. Now, uh, here's what he has to say. Uh, in this uh, essay or in this uh, lecture and framing, uh, he begins it in this way. And translation is always crazy, so if you, maybe you can read the German uh, if uh, you want to think about more what it means. Uh, in what follows, we shall be questioning concerning technology. I think he says we're not questioning the fact of technology. We're not questioning that technology uh, through uh, mechanisms of efficiency and so on does all sorts of things. Uh, uh, but we're questioning concerning technology, meaning the relationship between human purpose and 
the technological realization of that. So questioning, not dogmatically asserting anything, he says builds a way, it's an opening. Uh, Heidegger likes to use these metaphors like an opening in the forest and you're beginning to find your way through it. So it's an ongoing kind of business of questioning and uh, growing understanding or awareness. All ways of thinking, my term, discourse, all ways of thinking, more or less perceptively, lead through language in a manner that is extraordinary. We shall be questioning concerning technology, and so doing, uh, we should like to prepare a free relationship to it. And this idea of a free relation to technology is a theme that, that I'm trying to stress most of all. Uh, in many ways, of course, we're very dependent on technology. I already mentioned that if you're thinking about moving off the grid, you know, it's, it's not a trivial uh, task. Uh, we are sort of caught, ensnared. Uh, we are, our horizons are defined. You know, Heidegger says we are inframed. Uh, so we see things, you know, through this characterization of the world by technology. And in so doing, we don't see things in any other way, and in so doing, we don't have a free relationship. And in so doing, we don't exercise uh, our human impulses, perhaps, uh, as we should. Now, uh, uh, Bruno Latour, who's a very funny guy in many ways, and uh, I don't know, I found this Bruno Latour la action figure uh, someplace once. Uh, but uh, he uh, uh, tries to uh, both criticize and, and expand on Heidegger's uh, idea. He says, I need to define in opposition to Heidegger, Heidegger what mediation means in the realm of techniques. Um, so what he means is that, as I was saying, here's a human subject and technology is mediating our relation to other things. And he thinks that Heidegger's view of this mediation is a little bit unnuanced or something. Uh, he uses the idea of techniques uh, to uh, emphasize the plurality of technologies uh, and uh, suggests that our relationship to technology is uh, likewise pluralistic or multifaceted. We don't just relate to technology as such, right? Uh, in other words, simple kind of thing. Um, to say a sentence like, I'm a student at the university, of course implies you know, a relationship between you, an individual, and a large complex institution. But of course, the university just isn't one thing. The university is many departments, many programs, many individuals, many projects, and so on and so forth. And we may relate to those in various ways. And so this I take uh, to be one of the refinements of the Heideggerian problematic. Now here's Hans Jonas uh, coming from his, uh, uh, his uh, book that I was mentioning, uh, The Principle of Respons Imperative of Responsibility. And uh, in this he argues uh, that modern technology, and again he's not talking, and neither is Heidegger, and neither am I, about, you know, ordinary tool making or ordinary uh, technologies that really enable us to do what we want, but rather technology that maybe is doing things not exactly what we want or intend or even realize. He boils this down to five uh, issues. Uh, beyond human control, technology has advanced from tool to machine to automatic device and automatic device, which is not only, you know, something that runs on its own, but something now augmented by artificial intelligence, is directing itself, training itself, reproducing itself, uh, and so on. 
beyond our control. Uh, another reason why it's beyond our control has to do with its complexity. Uh, most people uh, don't understand the technology that they use. And I teach and have taught for quite a while in engineering schools and I know that engineers don't understand most of the tools that they use. They have kind of a black box model. This input, something mysterious happens inside and we get an output. And you know, you see their diagrams, their schematics, they're modular. Okay, so we have this unit, input, you know, boop, 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 output, I.O. kind of model. Uh, so we really don't know what's going on. And we really don't know, you know, what kinds of things uh, beyond the outputs that we recognize are going on. So this leads to this point. Uh, degree of human ignorance due to complexity. Technological processes are often not well understood. And for this, among other reasons, produce unanticipated consequences. Uh, thirdly, technology produces results disproportionate to human action. I call this the issue of overwhelming power. Uh, we can uh, destroy the world with a simple push of a button. We were all alarmed uh, not that long ago when uh, the uh, President of the United States, I have a hard time saying that phrase, but anyway, uh, Donald Trump is engaging rhetorically with uh, Chairman Kim and calling him little rocket man and saying, and I have a bigger button than he has, right? So, so, you know, you have a minuscule intellect pushing a button and enormous consequences. That's the kind of disproportionality I'm talking about. And the consequences can be disastrous. This contributes to the sense of crisis I'm talking about. Uh, technology may alter the environment permanently, that is to say our actions may be irreversible. Um, mostly technological practice uh, is iterative. You try something, doesn't work that well, so you try it again. Uh, you decide it's not worth pursuing, so you go down a different path. But we're getting to the state where that kind of control over technological activity is being gravely diminished. And we, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, altering the biosphere, uh, we have examples where things are irreversible. In the terms of using nuclear power, we have, you know, nuclear waste that we don't know how to dispose of yet, and which is changing the world for uh, eons into the future. And this is another thing, is the future, uh, because technology has consequences not just in the foreseeable future, not within the space that we're familiar with or control, but has consequences in time and space well beyond anything that we can even imagine. Now, if, here's Jonas's point, if we're going to act responsibly and the consequence of our actions is in a domain in space and time beyond which we have any relationship, how can we do it? And moreover, many people would say, why do I even care? You know, a lot of ethics is kind of contractual. Uh, I act toward you in ways uh, that, for example, I hope you will act toward me. You know, this is Kant's categorical imperative, also expressed in many religious traditions, something like the golden rule. Anyway, all of that disappears under the power of technology. Um, so, here's a few more words, just uh, you can read the top three things, uh, which are Jonas's own words and uh, more elegant uh, than my own, but essentially what I've been trying to say. Now, it's in this context that I want to bring up the conflict between uh, faith and reason, or sometimes it's put between science and religion. Um, personally, I think it's a bogus 
conflict, but it's how many uh, issues are framed. Uh, either we're going to be rational or we're going to uh, embrace faith. Faith comes from a domain of mystery. The Lord acts in mysterious ways, for example. Um, and so what happens is when you know, our calculative powers of reasoning sort of fall short, then we delegate decisions to faith. Even Kant, and of course Kant is misunderstood to some degree on this, but you know, Kant said, uh, uh, we have shown the limitations of reason in order to make room for faith. Right? In other words, reason can go so far, then reason, you know, through its uh, methods, comes up against uh, what uh, Kant called antinomies, where a rational process produces sort of positive and negative answers, so what do you do? For Kant, that's a sign of the limitations of reason that opens the door to faith. So, it's in that sense that I'm concerned about faith, uh, because faith, since the idea, you know, in this context is, well, we don't need to really understand, you know, the meaning of an action mandated by faith, but it's justified ethically anyway. All right, let's step back and try to uh, elaborate what I mean when I used the term earlier, incommensurability. Um, we're living in a presumptive relationship to the reliability of nature, and in some sense live according to nature. Nature is fixed, permanent, self-renewing, the source of our well-being. We all like to believe that, I think. Uh, and that's coming into question. How do we deal with that? How do we even talk about it? Ethics is meant to guide our actions toward and with each other, meaning it is presupposed that we can understand each other and that we are capable, each of us, of governing our own actions. I've said enough to show why I think that position is questionable. Faith allows for the possibility of a revealed truth, and we may not be able to understand this truth fully. Nonetheless, uh, by living it, we hope for some kind of redemption. All right, so the crisis of the earth means mostly the vulnerability of the earth. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, we've been becoming aware of more and more. Uh, I believe at every meal since I've been here, one of the entrees offered was codfish. And a few years ago, you know, they had to suspend the fishing of codfish because essentially the oceans had almost run out of it. Right. So um, we have a situation uh, where the earth is in crisis and is limited. All right, here's a couple of traditions I'm going to... Uh, quickly opposed to each other. This is from the uh, Taoist tradition of Zhuangzi. Everybody, most everybody knows this famous story about uh, dreaming about a butterfly. But here's a little story about technology and uh, uh, suggesting that, that there are reasons why you might not want to use technology even though it's available and even though it's uh, uh, more efficient. The argument uh, is that somehow the use of technology is going to undermine our status uh, as a human. Something to think about. Opposed to this is the uh, sort of foundational idea of Western civilization, which is expressed in many places, but which I've taken from uh, the famous chorus from uh, Sophocles Antigone. Uh, and here, uh, it's recognized both that uh, humans are dependent on the earth and on nature, but everything we're doing is like being at war with it. But that's the way it is, and this is the genius of, of civilization. So, so this, you know, sort of uh, Western foundational idea, as opposed to this Taoist one, in a way show a spectrum within which I'm trying to discuss things. 
All right, back to uh, 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 Amitav Ghosh uh, in the Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. Uh, his argument is that modern literature, history and politics, uh, uh, that these three cultural modes share assumptions that make thinking about environmental crises, specifically anthropogenic, climate change, and the developing of the sixth mass extinction, impossible to think. Now, it's sort of an invitation for you to reflect on that and look at literature in the lecture. Uh, he tries to give examples, uh, but basically he's saying that uh, the sort of canons of literary imagination have boundaries, and these boundaries don't allow us uh, to uh, uh, sort of explore in ways that will contribute to the general discourse, uh, this kind of problem. The problem becomes relegated to the problem for experts to solve. It becomes a problem that, well, there must be a technological solution, and the experts, uh, the engineers and scientists and so on, will leave it up to them, and uh, therefore uh, uh, the humanities are important for some other reason, but not for dealing with this kind of thing. Um, this, I'm just going to recommend this novel, if you haven't read it, in which uh, sort of the struggle with nature and tradition is uh, vividly uh, explored. Um, and this is just an example that, uh, you know, even though we have the science and can predict events like this, uh, they happen and we always seem un... We always seem surprised by them and unprepared for them and always use terms like, well, that was a hundred year flood, so now we've had it and uh, we don't need to face it anymore. Um, I challenged uh, uh, Gosha's thesis about the limitations of literary discourse to challenge, to raise these kinds of questions by looking at some science fiction uh, and I don't read a lot of science fiction, uh, but this Chinese author, um, uh, who's uh, very popular in China now, where science fiction isn't a great uh, tradition, um, uh, seems to address these straight on. Uh, he, the author, uh, was trained as an engineer, uh, but his uh, critique of the problems of the human condition do not rely on technological solutions. And one sees this particularly in the second volume of uh, the trilogy uh, that, uh, uh, that he's written, a Remembrance of Earth's Past, uh, called The Dark Forest. Okay, about climate change in particular, um, I was asked to write about this in relationship to the Paris Accords and the possibility of implementing the Paris Accords. Uh, and uh, as I thought about it, I thought, well, the issue of climate change uh, raises these kinds of questions, questions of epistemological ambiguity and uncertainty. Well, yeah, I mean, climate deniers, climate change deniers, I think, are you know, people with their head in the sand. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they struggle to make their argument because of certain uh, actual epistemological ambiguities and uncertainties. Um, there is the question of fairness. Uh, rich countries, you know, did the pollution, and now we're asking poor countries in a way to pay for what we've done, if we're going to correct this. Uh, the issue I raised before, faith in the goodness of nature, uh, and then a kind of techno-optimism. There's got to be a technological solution. Now, uh, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Portuguese, so I'm going to say his name incorrectly, I think, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, recognizes that climate change is primarily and fundamentally and overwhelmingly an ethical problem. But he thinks that, well, we can solve it because we just have to sort of own up to it and, and make the commitment. I don't think that, that we can simply do that because 
I think that while the imperative is clear, the ethical imperative is clear, the specific kinds of ethics that allows us to resolve the questions is not. So we really need uh, a non-anthropocentric ethics. Most ethics is about person to person or group to person uh, or within a family structure or within a political uh, construct or something like this. And for the most part, traditional ethics have not uh, dealt with uh, our relations to nature as specifically ethical issues uh, and has not uh, raised issues of, uh, to be sure, uh, the uh, influence of uh, artificial beings such as uh, uh, robots driven by uh, highly advanced artificial intelligence. Uh, so, what is the ground for ethical duty, or what is the basis for responsibility? This is where we, I think, fall short. This is where we sort of don't know where to go next. Uh, if we want to say, well, ethics is simply, you know, uh, the uh, consensus of most people, uh, well, uh, that can lead anywhere. Uh, if we uh, invoke things like uh, the sacredness of life, uh, I think uh, uh, these days we have to ask really what does that mean and why is uh, life uh, worth preserving and is it worth preserving at all costs? I heard several people at this conference uh, say things like, well, you know, the earth, we're, it's not our job to save the earth uh, because the earth's going to be here long after we're gone and, uh, you know, uh, that statement, among many true things that it asserts, in my opinion, uh, suggests that we really don't have grounds for saying that human life is more important than anything else. And I don't think we do have grounds for saying that human life is more important than anything else. But that's kind of, you know, the bottom line for most traditional ethics. So where do we go and what do we do? Heidegger becomes very pessimistic about this. Uh, and he said in a famous interview that he gave uh, in Der Spiegel, uh, philosophy will not be able to affect any direct transformation of the present state of the world. He says philosophy, he could just as well have said the humanities, or he could have said the human sciences, or he could have said human approaches to trying to understand things. Uh, this is true not only of philosophy, but of any simply human contemplation and striving. Only a God can save us now. Coming from Heidegger's mouth, we may question it, but it shows a kind of uh, uh, recognition of the uh, limitations of our uh, ability to understand and to chart our future. And uh, Heidegger, uh, uh, I think, recognizes the need for technological ethics. So, recapping what Jonas said before, uh, this is somehow the shape of the kind of ethics or the reason for the kind of new ethics, technological ethics, that is needed. Now about faith, uh, so an extreme way of understanding faith is uh, in terms of what Søren Kierkegaard called the teleological suspension of the ethical. So teleology, this means, you know, what is purpose? What are we doing? Uh, and uh, presumably ethics is uh, very much part of human purpose uh, and our striving toward the good and the true and the beautiful. Uh, Kierkegaard says sometimes it's necessary in order to preserve or in order to uphold that general good, or that general telos, to suspend it, right? So suspend means two things. It means to stop, and it also means to hold up, like a suspension bridge, right? And so he means it in both senses. And uh, uh, the example uh, that he gives to illustrate a teleological suspension of the ethical uh, is the story uh, that appears in the Hebrew Bible and in the uh, different version in Islamic texts about... Uh, uh, Abraham's willingness to 
uh, sacrifice his son, uh, either Isaac or Ishmael. And uh, uh, Kierkegaard's reading of this is, of course, on every conceivable way, this is unethical. But it was the right thing to do. Why? In a sense, to fulfill the divine plan, uh, which we can't understand. Um, so this sort of thinking, maybe you might call it Gnostic thinking, uh, is a danger which it seems to me uh, is uh, uh, raised by technology. Uh, in non-philosophical discussions, this is easily reduced uh, to something uh, which allows for the uh, justification of some pernicious decisions. So, with this kind of uh, uh, Heideggerian dystopian construct of the world, uh, what can we do? Uh, and uh, uh, I'm suggesting uh, that we don't succumb to a kind of Gnostic paradigm where we're guided by you know, some sort of uh, insight which we can't uh, explain, but which we defend on the basis of faith, uh, but that we look to some of the uh, suggestions by Ghosh, uh, Shishun, and now I'm going to mention mostly Arendt. Uh, so Hannah Arendt uh, contrasts uh, throughout her writing thinking uh, to problem solving. Well, problem solving, in a sense, you already know what the solution is going to be, or at least you know what's desirable or what you want, uh, and the problem is, how do I get to there? Uh, so uh, I need to be over here, there's an intervening river, uh, so problem solving is, do I build a boat? Do I build a bridge? Uh, do I uh, uh, get some springs on my shoes and leap over it? How do I do it? Uh, so that's problem solving sort of uh, caricatured. Uh, thinking, on the other hand, is very, very open. It's undefined. It's like uh, what Heidegger was calling questioning that opens a way. Um, and uh, it is uh, uh, something which uh, is governed by uh, not only calculative uh, capabilities, but uh, other sorts of human sensibilities and aesthetic responses uh, in particular. Uh, Arendt uh, uh, talks about imagination uh, and uh, connects imagination to judgment and specifically to political judgment. Uh, her book, Responsibility and Judgment, uh, is uh, uh, mostly about uh, Kant. Um, she uh, uh, recognizes the importance of the work of art and our encounters with art. Uh, which, if you think about it, is always or almost always a kind of opening experience. Uh, and even when we don't have uh, a cognitive uh, grasp of it. Uh, so that, for example, the other evening we heard a very beautiful uh, recital of uh, Portuguese Fado. Uh, I don't understand any Portuguese, but nevertheless uh, it was opening and sort of brought me into the soul of the experience uh, that was being sung about. So this is kind of the power of art, and uh, Arendt feels, I think, Heidegger feels, uh, many people are suggesting that uh, technology is sort of <coughs> tamping down on that and narrowing our abilities to uh, experience it. Um, is this the way of modernity, coming back to Bruno Latour? Uh, briefly, he argues, well, we've never uh, been modern. That is to say, uh, modern man, modern human being, uh, autonomous, uh, guided by reason, uh, walking the road of progress. This has only been a myth. And we have to acknowledge the other uh, elements in uh, experience that are more ambiguous and more, in a way, primal. So I'm just going to conclude uh, referencing uh, Anna Arendt's uh, description of uh, the dilemma. 
By the way, I'm showing you the UN uh, sustainability goals for 2030, uh, which I think humanists need to be addressing. Uh, she said, the modern age with its growing world alienation has led to a situation where man, human beings, wherever they go, encounter only themselves. All the processes of the earth and the universe have revealed themselves either as human-made or as potentially human-made. So in a sense, um, we uh, uh, are caught uh, in the world that we've built and we don't know how to find our way about it. Arendt wanted to call her book, uh, her first book, The Human Condition, she wanted to call it uh, Man's Fate uh, because uh, she was thinking about the experience that Andre Malraux had uh, and is in his novel Man's Fate uh, where somebody is listening to their own voice on a tape recorder and they don't recognize that it's their own voice. So that's kind of where we are now. We've built this world, but we don't recognize where we are, and we don't know where to go. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. question is, well, where do we get that hierarchy from? And, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, in, in the Confucian tradition, the hierarchy is somehow, uh, you know, imitation or reflection of the uh, natural ordering as evidenced in, in heaven or in Tien. And other kinds of uh, uh, examples of so-called natural hierarchies have also been proposed through histories, different uh, kinds of things. Uh, Historically, usually uh, men are a little bit higher on the hierarchy than, than women, which is, you know, not something I can justify. Um, uh, and so the, the question becomes, you know, where do we get an ordering principle? Now, it would seem, uh, on the face of it, that technology is all about order and sequence and regularity and rationality and so on and so forth. So you would think that, well, what we can do is build a highly well-ordered and efficient society, right? And uh, normally the analysis of technology, you know, builds on Aristotle's uh, fourfold definition of cause. Uh, so you're taking into account, you know, the materials you're using, the, the ideal form, the purpose, and what's more efficient or effective, right? And, and technology is mostly focused on that efficiency issue. Uh, but it only works in the context of a, of a rational ordering system. The uh, problem is we don't seem to recognize the order that we've built. And so, so what you've done, I think, is put your finger really on the heart of the problem uh, in a different way than I did, but, but precisely the same problem. And for which, I'm sorry to say, I don't have an answer.
came out to me and we wanted to uh, talk. Um, man makes his own history. And in the process of making his own history, I propose uh, the what we call instrumental rationality and value rationality co-exist and co-develop uh, uh, along a long kind of Arab yeah. uh, structure. So that's the, uh, I think that, that causes the dilemma of human condition. And, 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 you know, when I was trying to talk about the incommensurability, the things out of whack mm -hmm. is the instrumentality. Right, and, and uh, my argument is that the instrumentality, in other words, the set of instrumentalities collectively we call technology, is what's creating this sort of negotiation among these other elements in the, uh, in the triangle, uh, the difficult. Right, and so um, this this uh, 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 animation of technology, mm -hmm. Be very, I mean, very well overwhelming. Not not only at this age of AI or digital technology, but since since the very beginning of mechanical age, as an aftermath of industrialization, maybe and even. And then the beginning of the mechanical age uh, was premised on the idea that that somehow we were the controller. Right. Right, so, so you have the machine and then you have the control center. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, uh, there's some problems with that way of, of thinking about it and that uh, in any event, uh, so much of contemporary technology uh, exceeds our capacity to control it. Right. Uh, or we control it, but only in a kind of proximate way. In other words, the button example. That's I'm in charge, but you know, I didn't mean to do that or I did mean, but I was not thinking or I was, right. Or, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. Or technology has gone ahead and solved the problem for us. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, that, that does this. Um, it's fun, in a depressing sort of way, uh, in New York to, uh, you know, go to bars and cafeterias around universities and watch, you know, people sitting there who, well, they're not dating, uh, they're going to hook up. And the way they're going to hook up is on some hookup app that they've got, yes. right? Yes. Now, where in the world did this sort of modality of socializing mm -hmm. come from? Nobody sat back and said, hey, this is a good idea because I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed about talking to you know, this person that I find attractive, therefore I'm going to have an app that's going to do it for me and I'm never going to you know, have to define the terms and if we both agree then we're, we're off to get drunk and then go to bed. Uh, you know, I mean, that wasn't a plan. That's what happened in a sense, right? So um, this, this is part of the way in which our controlling, uh, I mean, what does, you know, calculative reasoning have to do with this kind of social dynamic, I guess is what I'm trying to raise. It's a question. We're not aware of it, yeah. Any nation. Yeah. By you know, technology, uh, AI, digital stuff, etc. That's a problem. I think so, yes. We're not aware of it, and <coughs> the consequences of not being aware of it are enormous. Um, and if you still care about the good, the true, and the beautiful, uh, that's getting lost. Mm. Those are the three things I would say. Yeah. So the idea of suspense, I think, is, is, is very... That's, that's what the people look for, in a way. You know, let me get, let me get off the world. Mm. Stop the train, or stop the plane, and stop the earth. I'm going to get off and go where it's simple and, and clear. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
and then we resume.